welcome ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues. We're going to turn the microphone over to Dr. Moss. Okay, thank you, Liz, appreciate it. Welcome everybody. Glad you're with us this evening. Uh, we've got a good crowd tonight and we have a great speaker too. So it's gonna be a, a, an informative evening and we're all gonna learn and uh, glad to have you with us, Julie. Um, we're gonna um, give a little bit more details of her uh, background because we wanna know who she is. Uh, Dr. Prieto is an historian at the US Army Center of Military History at Fort McNair, which is where I met her back when she started there in 2014. She received her PhD from Stanford University in 2013. She taught both United States and Latin American history at several universities before joining the Histories Directed, Directorate at the Center of Military History, where she is currently writing a book on the United States Army in Latin America from 1945 to 1963. She is the author of The Mexican Expedition, 1916 to 1917, which is the first publication of the Center of Military History's uh, series on the US Army in uh, campaigns of World War I. Her work has been published in the journal Book History and has appeared in edited, collect uh, edited collections. So Julie, thanks very much for joining us. We're glad you're with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I'm going to start by saying um, that when we talk about the Mexican expedition, there are a couple key things to remember. One is that this is sort of the last hurrah for the frontier army. And it's a time when the army is starting to transition to being a different kind of force. Um, part of this is the use of new technologies. One of the interesting things about the expedition is that this is the first time the army actually uses trucks and airplanes as part of a major operation. Um, the thing that you're staring at, if you can see the pictures, is a map of the roads that they use in Mexico. You can already sort of see that the expedition um, is, is hampered in terms of movements and communication. You can see the, this is a map of all the roads that they use in northern Mexico. You can see they go mostly north-south in Mexico, especially northern Mexico. It's really easy to go north-south. It's really hard to go east-west because of the mountains. So communicating is really hard. Um, very few roads very difficult to get around. So trucks and airplanes really do make a difference as, as you'll see sort of as the expedition goes on. So I'm gonna start with some background uh, for us here. I know there's some history buffs in the audience as I could tell from the polls, but we're gonna go into some other, uh, some other background. So first I'm gonna tell you that the punitive expedition happens along the backdrop of the Mexican Revolution. So this is a war that lasts from 1910 to 1920, and it's still really the crucial watershed event in Mexican history. Um, it's a civil war, but unlike our war, there aren't two sides vying for control. It's really multiple sides, and they uh, fight in several distinct phases. Um, it also leads to death on a massive scale in Mexico. Something like 2 million people out of a population of 15 million died during the revolution, and it causes massive movements of people into cities off of farms and people who are displaced because of the fighting or who participate in the fighting. So out of this complex chaotic scene in Mexico, by early 1913, you have a force emerging uh, known as the Constitutionalists. So the Constitutionalists are led by Venustiano Carranza. You can see him right there with his awesome beard. Uh, and this is a loose coalition of moderate political reformers. Carranza allies with several local military leaders, these strong men who are locally very powerful. One of them is Pancho Villa, who you can also see there in his great suit. So Pancho Villa, that's not his real name. He was born Jose Doroteo Aranga in the Northern state of Durango. And his early history is very fuzzy, um, but he seems to have joined an outlaw gang that committed robberies when he was younger, which is how he got his name. He named himself after an outlaw in Northern Mexico. And when the revolution started, he began raising, raising an army, but he's jailed and then exiled for a short time to the US. He crosses back at some point into Mexico and raises an army again. And this force is known as the División del Norte, so the Division of the North. And at its peak, it's 30,000 to 50,000 soldiers. 
Um, the army wins a series of successes on behalf of the constitutionalists in Northern Mexico, mostly through Chihuahua, Durango, and Sonora. So they're operating really in the Northern few states. Um, this is the era that he becomes really famous. He becomes this great romantic figure, right? Who we all sort of know or think we know. Um, he's followed around by journalists and newsreel makers from the US. He even has correspondence uh, with General Pershing who ends up leading the expedition against him to capture him. Um, and he also talks, uh, he meets with uh, the Army Chief of Staff, General Hugh Scott. Um, Pershing seems to have sent via some books on tactics but Villa was probably illiterate um, and he only spoke Spanish, so he probably didn't learn too much from the books. Um, here's a picture of them together. So you can see Villa and Pershing having a great time. Uh, they seem to have actually got along, gone along pretty well in person. So in 1914, Carranza's forces took over Mexico City and Villa breaks with the constitutionalists. Villa is much more interested in amassing personal power than any sort of political reform movement. And once they no longer have a common enemy, he's like, eh, I just want power, forget you guys. So he breaks off. Um, at first he had some successes in the field, but by 1915, he suffered a few defeats. And by September, 1915, his army is down to a very small number. So his army is down to somewhere between 500 and a thousand troops. Um, most of these men are known as the Dorados, which is like, means like the golden, the, the golden ones. Um, so this is the name for Villa's elite guard. So these are men who had personal loyalty to Villa and they supplement their numbers by raiding towns and impressing troops. So they're no longer powerful enough to really recruit troops without force, um, which is a sign of how weak the army has really become. The, the DVC on the Norte also has major shortages of arms and ammunition and everything else. Um, Villa's forces really cannot conduct regular warfare at this point. It's really a small raiding force. Um, if this weren't enough, uh, in October, President Woodrow Wilson uh, recognized Carranza as the legitimate president of Mexico. Uh, that's a really big problem for Villa because by law, only the legitimate government of Mexico could legally purchase weapons from the U.S. So Carranza can buy supplies, but Villa can't. That's a huge blow. All right, so once Villa is backed into a corner in October 1915, he starts to focus on attacking U.S. citizens. This is a major change in, in his tactics. He's avoided U.S. citizens up until now. So why does he change? There's two reasons. The first um, is sort of obvious. He's trying to create a break, right, between Carranza and Wilson. He thinks if he creates the impression that Carranza isn't really in control, that Wilson's going to withdraw his recognition and then Carranza can't buy arms. Uh, the second reason is that Villa seems to have genuinely believed in a conspiracy theory that was going around at the time. He believed that Carranza had entered into a corrupt bargain with Wilson and that in exchange for recognition, Carranza had actually promised to hand over Mexican territory to the United States. Um, there's no truth in this. Like no one can find any evidence that anything even remotely like this would have existed. But Villa seems to genuinely believe this. So he's motivated also by revenge. Um, Villa starts putting this, these new tactics into action in January 1916. Villa's attacked a train in Mexico transporting U.S. mining engineers south. Um, Villa's kill 17 U.S. citizens on board, but this doesn't provoke enough of a reaction um, in the U.S., right? So Villa starts planning a raid on U.S. territory itself. So fast forward to March 9th, the early morning hours. 500 Villistas, not Villa himself, but 500 Villistas crossed the border and advanced on the small border town of Columbus, New Mexico. Um, why is Columbus chosen? It's not very clear, except that Columbus is pretty small. It's a relatively isolated town. And Villa seems to have been under the impression that it was very lightly defended. Um, there was an army post attached uh, to the town called Camp Furlong, which was home to one squadron of the 13th Cavalry. About 120 soldiers were in town at the time. Villa seems to have thought it was fewer than that, um, although they are pretty outnumbered and is about five to one. Uh, the Villas just enter town and they divide up into two columns. Uh, one of these rode to the center of town and there they burned down the commercial hotel, which is the biggest hotel in town, 
a grocery and then they start setting fires to other buildings. Um, a couple blocks away from the commercial hotel, there's another hotel called the Hoover Hotel. Uh, that one's made out of Adobe. Adobe is relatively fireproof. And inside there's a switchboard operator. She manages to call Fort Bliss and let them know what's happening, let them know about the attack. So word of it really spreads right away as the raid is happening, you know, as the attack is underway. The second column of the Eastas goes into Camp Furlong. Even though the soldiers are really caught off guard, um, they put up a pretty good fight. Uh, they pulled out and set up a Hotchkiss machine gun, which is this French style machine gun on a little hill by the railroad tracks in between Camp Furlong and the town. And they managed to set it up. These guns jam really easily. So th they set up the gun, it jams. They go get another one that jams again. They run through four different guns, but they managed to um, they managed to get four essentially until they sort of like run out of them and can't find any more. Uh, the men in the kitchen even got in on the action. So attacking beast is went into the kitchen by accident and the, the, um, the cooks go and attack them with kitchen knives and boiling water, all the implements that they're using to get ready for breakfast, I assume. Uh, the raid lasts about two hours. Um, as the Vistas are withdrawing from town, Major Frank Tompkins gets together a contingent of cavalry and starts pursuing the raiders south. Um, after some time, he actually realizes that he crossed into Mexico at some point. Um, so he sends a message back to his commander asking him what to do. His commander says to use his best judgment, um, which is a pretty clear wink and a nod to me anyway, and to him uh, that he should just continue pursuing. So he follows the beast to south about 15 miles into Mexico before he's forced to turn around. Um, overall, the attack is pretty devastating to the town. Um, a good part of the core is, the downtown core is burned um, and you have 10 civilians who were killed. Eight soldiers were killed as well but it's a much larger disaster on the Vista side. Um, they lost at least a hundred soldiers. So at least a hundred soldiers are killed. Considering that the whole force is something like 500 to a thousand at that point, that's a really big blow. Um, you know, the other thing to remember is this is a huge news story in the US because obviously it's an attack on US soil. Uh, President Woodrow Wilson would have had a really tough time ignoring this really at any time in US history, but it's also an election year, keep in mind. So he really cannot just let this slide. Um, the next day, in fact, Woodrow Wilson authorized an expedition to go into Northern Mexico, into the state of Chihuahua, right over the border and disband Villa forces. The mission of the expedition is actually not to capture Villa, it's to disband his forces because Wilson recognized that it's, it would probably be impossible to find just one person, to find just the man himself. But he thought the army could handle eliminating the East as, as a force in Northern Mexico. Remember, they're already quite weakened. So the War Department chooses General John J. Blackjack Pershing to lead the expedition. Pershing's a little bit of a strange choice. There's a higher ranking guy there. Uh, General Frederick Funston was in charge of the Southern District, but Pershing has already been recognized as a talent in the army at this point. Um, under Teddy Roosevelt, he was promoted well ahead of his peers. He had served in, Philippine, in the Philippines as a governor and then at Fort Bliss. Um, when he was at Fort Bliss the year before, the August before, his wife and four children were in a house in the Presidio, which caught on fire, and all but one of his children died. Um, he dealt with this tragedy by uh, returning to work and never talking about it, never dealing with it publicly. Um, it probably still weighed quite heavily on him at this point in his life because it was relatively recent and a terrible tragedy, but he really keeps it to himself. He just, you know, goes back to the trail. Beyond that, beyond Pershing's personal uh, issues in the expedition, the expedition as a whole faces a series of challenges as it's getting going. Um, the first is really the terrain. I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch the slide. Oh, so this is just a set show too that um, I switched these, that the, the border, this is a picture of the border actually between Nogales, Sonora and Nogales, Arizona. And you can see that the border, even in towns, is actually quite open at this time. So these are two soldiers who are standing on either side of the border. And you can see there's, there wasn't really a lot of fencing. 
Um, there were sort of, um, you know, border stations, but you could pretty easily cross the border, especially in isolated places like Columbus, New Mexico. And for comparison, there's a picture of it, of the same, almost the same spot. You can see the hill in the background um, today where there's a lot of fencing, there's police, it's actually hard to get across. Then, you know, not so much. Um, and this is a picture of Columbus just after the raid. So you can see the scale of devastation is um, it's pretty high for a small town, right? To have you know most of the downtown burn, it's it's a it's a big deal. Uh, and we'll we'll leave these guys on horses here. Uh, so back to what I was saying. So the there's a couple challenges operating in Chihuahua. One's the terrain. The state of Chihuahua shares a border with Texas that's quite large, um, and the the state itself is about the size of Michigan. So it's not small. Um, most of it's a high desert plateau. Um, but it rises in the west up to the Sierra Madre, which reaches peaks of around uh, 10,000 feet. So the climate and temperature really varies quite a bit at the different elevations. Um, the state's also prone to severe weather, so there are frequent violent dust storms, and there wasn't much grass for horses. Um, this is a cavalry campaign, so that's a really big deal. Um, the, uh, the other thing is that it can actually get quite cold, so a lot of the men are sent um, initially without cold weather supplies, so without blankets and wool coats on the assumption that it is a desert, but it can get pretty cold and, co and snow even in spring. Um, the second thing is that Chihuahua in the early 20th century was still quite remote. There were pretty, there were few roads and telegraph lines and lots of the roads that did exist were unpaved and turned into mud pits in the rain. Um, this makes communications and difficult uh, across the state like very difficult. Um, there were two railroads that bisected the state, but after years of war, these weren't really in great shape, as we're going to see. The third challenge to remember is that currency to forces were still operating in the area. So the Army of the Northeast was actually assembling and preparing to launch an offensive against the Vistas. Um, Wilson thought really when they got started, that Carranza's government might actually welcome the expedition. Um, after all, Carranza is trying to eliminate Villa as well, but instead Carranza declares that the expedition is an illegal encroachment into Mexican territory. Um, first of all, he seems to have really believed that the US shouldn't get involved in the Mexican revolution, but even if he didn't, even if he had welcomed the help, if you recall, there's this rumor going around that he's going to give Mexican territory over to Wilson. So he really couldn't ally himself very closely to the US government. And because of this, the expedition's always in danger of clashing with currencies to forces who wanted to push the US army out of Chihuahua. So Pershing initially amasses about 4,800 troops at Columbus. These troops get divided into two columns, a Western column and an Eastern column. Each of these columns has a unit of Apache scouts um, attached to aid in tracking. And this is a picture of the Apache scouts. This is actually the last time that Apache scout, scouts are used as part of a major operation um, in the US Army, but they had been um, attached to columns since the 1870s um, looking for indigenous, uh, indigenous tribes in the uh, American Southwest. Um, so the Western column includes the 10th Cavalry. This is a unit of Buffalo soldiers. Buffalo soldiers were segregated units consisting of African Americans who were mostly commanded by white officers. But the 10th Cavalry was commanded by Major Charles Young, who was one of the very few uh, African American officers in command. And he was only the third African American to graduate from West Point. Um, Pershing went with the Western Column, which crossed into Chihuahua first, and he set up headquarters about 100 miles south of the border in Colonia Dublon. This was a Mormon town. He sets up in a Mormon town because a lot of the locals were friendly to the US, some had been born in the US, and it's also very close to a rail line. Um, Pershing then decided that the Western Column should, should push south to the town of Babacora, following intelligence that Villa was in the area. So Pershing divides up his column into three. One of these just rides south and the other two are supposed to take the railroad. Um, one unit is supposed to unload just north of the town and one is supposed to unload just south of the town so they can converge on Babacora from three different directions. Um, this turns out to be a huge disaster. The train, when it arrives, is in horrible condition. 
Uh, there are holes in the floors from old cooking fires and gaps in the walls. So the men have to stop and chop down fences and telegraph poles just to do the repairs. They finally leave the Colonia Dublin, uh, but the conductor then refuses to stop for fuel. So the men have to stop again and chop down an animal pen for firewood. They continue on and then they run out of water. So they have to go all the way back to Colonia Dublin. Um, they depart again once they get water and they made it to the town of El Rucio, which is north of Babacora, but the train's too heavy to climb a slope that's heading into town. So the unit that was supposed to get off north of Babacora just gets off the train early. The rest continued on and the train gets to the top of the hill and then as it's going down, it derailed into the town. Um, to make matters worse, after all of this trouble, once they get into Babacora, they realize that Bia hasn't even been there for months. The intelligence was wrong. Um, meanwhile, you have the Eastern Column. They cross into uh, the border afterwards and head south. And they're heading south to the town of Guerrero under the command of Colonel George Dodd. Um, amazingly, Villa was actually in Guerrero at the time. Um, so he showed up there, he's trying to recruit troops and he attacked a Karencista outpost in the town. In the middle of this fighting, actually, someone shoots Villa in the leg, maybe one of his own guys, we don't really know. And then he's taken to the home of a doctor who advises him to do surgery. Um, Bia refuses. He knows that Carranza's forces or the U.S. Army are going to catch him if he stays somewhere too long. So he left. He goes into hiding. And after this point, he's no longer in communication with his forces until July. Um, his subordinates are acting semi-independently, and they themselves probably didn't know whether Villa was alive or dead for at least the next several weeks. Um, very few people know where he was. It seems like some of his cousins were bringing him food and water, but these are people who are really loyal to him and close to him, and people who are not going to willingly give up um, his location uh, freely. So as Dodd's heading to Guerrero, while Villa's still in town, he makes it to a, a town called Bachineva at nightfall, but to get to Guerrero, he needed a guide to take him over the mountains. The only person he found was really reluctant. This guy led him on this really circuitous route that seems to triple the distance. And then he refused to let them ride into town. So Dodd had to wait and approach by day, but then Via's gone, right? So he got pretty close to capturing Via, or at least getting close to Via, but not quite. Um, in town, Dodd heard, hears pretty quickly about Via's injuries. And so he goes back to tell Pershing. Pershing then divided the, the um, provisional detachments into what he called flying columns. So these are supposed to be small, light, highly mobile units that can kind of fan out into the countryside and pursue intelligence wherever they find it. Um, Colonel Tompkins, who we talked about earlier, was in command of one of these flying columns and he headed towards the town of Paral. So on the way, he runs into a man who claims to be part of the currency to garrison in town. And he says, oh, if they come into town, they'll be welcome. They can buy supplies. They can rest. They can camp. He's supposed to go notify the general in town. But when Tompkins shows up the next day, the general's caught off guard. He had no idea they were coming. Um, so as the general and Tompkins were talking in the general's office in the center of town, a crowd of onlookers comes and forms and starts shouting. Someone lets loose a mule into the crowd. Um, with this, the temperature sort of going up, uh, the general and Tompkins, they get on their horses and they go examine a campground um, that the general says, well, you can camp here outside of town. Tompkins gets there um, and he sees that it's the campsite intended as, as sort of a horseshoe ridge. And he's like, ah, oh, this is too difficult to defend. So he rejects it as they're talking a group of cavalry crests the ridge of the horseshoe and starts coming towards them. The currency to general actually tries to stop them from advancing. He sort of runs forward and tells them, no, no, no. Um, but eventually they start shooting anyway. He can't stop them from advancing. So Tompkins withdrew. He goes north along the Paral Santa Cruz road. The cavalry managed to get ahead of the enemy and slow down the pursuers by getting behind a stone wall and shooting. Um, but in this melee, Tompkins is shot in the shoulder. Eventually, the pursuers break off and they manage to send messengers north who run into Major Young uh, and the 10th Cavalry, and they converge on Santa Cruz. So 
When Pershing finds out about this, he goes back up to Colonia Dublin again to communicate with the U.S., to ask them what he should do. After all, they have just clashed with, with Karencistas, right? Even though their objective is Beistas. Um, Pershing's recommendation actually is to escalate the war, is to make a wider war. He is in favor of seizing the entire state of Chihuahua so they can operate freely. Wilson says no. He says, no, 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 no. He's already seeing the possibility that the U.S. is going to enter the war with in France, and he did not want to be tied down in occupation of Mexico. So he actually tells Pershing to back off quite a bit. So Pershing um, divides up Chihuahua instead into five districts and assigns cavalry to patrol each. So this is partly so that the U.S. Army now has less of a chance of running into Carranza's forces, but it also means that their movements are more regular and it's harder for them to run into the Eastas too. Um, they still managed to run into a few. Um, in mid-May, a young Lieutenant named uh, George S. Patton leads a detail to go purchase corn. And he, as he approaches the ranch where he's supposed to go make his purchase, someone started shooting from an entryway. Um, the men shot back and it ended up that they killed an important via subordinate. This is a part of the whole patent lore, but it happened more or less by accident. He wasn't trying to do anything but get some food. Um, the East has also attack the US again in a much smaller raid, this time on a waxwork in Texas. So the cavalry again pursue um, the attackers into Mexico. It's a really minor raid, but it convinces Wilson that the border is becoming more dangerous and that this could es escalate into a bigger conflict. So as a result, on May 9th, he called up the National Guard from three states to patrol the border area. Call up initially is for 4,500 troops, but there weren't enough men in Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas, which is where the initial call up is to meet this number. So he eventually expanded it to all the states. Um, at its peak, the National Guard deployment is about 110,000 troops. And most of those people are uh, deployed along the length of the border. They're mostly doing patrols, they're drilling, they're doing training. Um, they don't see a lot of action beyond that. Um, while the situation is still tense, Pershing met with the commander of Carranza's army to, of the Northeast. Um, the commander warns him that he's starting his offensive against Villa and he says, stay out of my way. And he warns Pershing, he says, look, you can only move north. You can't move in any other direction. And Pershing says, basically, you are not my boss. So I'm gonna move in whatever direction I want to. Um, although he's still patrolling in these districts, right? He's not moving too much over the countryside. Um, in late June though, Pershing starts hearing reports of a buildup of currencies in a town called Via Omada. Um, so he decides to send troops from the 10th Cavalry under uh, the command of Charles Boyd to do some reconnaissance, just to see what's going on. Um, before they head off, Pershing warns Boyd that the state of affairs is very delicate, and he tells him to avoid running into currencies as if he can to just report. Um, Boyd, though, seems to have taken the opposite um, view of their talk. Um, he had a Mormon guy named Lem Spilsbury from Colonia Dublin who reported afterwards that Boyd said that if they were fired upon, the War Department was ready to send in a full-scale invasion and that he was, quote, making history. So um, he did not take very seriously Pershing's injunction to not run into Karen Sistas. Um, On the way to Vialma, the, the two troops that are sent approach a town called Carrizal. Spillsbury and the other guys tell Boyd to go around the town. Towns filled with adobe structures and which provide defenders with excellent cover and are pretty fireproof. Boyd refuses and he decides to go through the town. Um, on the outskirts, he encounters 400 Karencistas. Uh, the commander asks him to withdraw from the north. Spillsbury again says, you should go around the town. Boyd says, no, he decides to go through. Instead, Boyd leads the Buffalo soldiers in an advance on horseback. Then they dismount and continue the last 500 year yards on foot before the Mexican soldiers open fire. Um, one troop's able to move into a depression, but Boyd is shot and killed. Um, the other captain who's left, uh, despite being wounded, 
or a, a retreat, and the men then sort of stream back to Colonia Dublon over the course of the next two days. Um, nine soldiers were killed in this engagement, nine U.S. soldiers, and 23 plus that civilian guide were taken prisoner and sent to Chihuahua City. Um, Carranza's forces in Carzal telegraphed the capital to report on the engagement pretty much right away. So Wilson found out about the clash by reading the news. He read it in the evening papers. Um, Pershing, though, doesn't find out about it until those survivors start straggling back into camp um, the next day. So it's a little bit of a black eye for him because he doesn't seem to have a very good handle on what his own men are doing in the field. He is almost the last to know about it. Um, as for the prisoners, they spend the next week in this Chihuahua City jail, but the British consul's there, the press come visit them every day. They're pretty well treated, released after a week. Um, so right after Carazal, Frederick Funston, uh, General Frederick Funston, orders Pershing to stay in a zone of no more than 150 miles from the border. So this effectively means that the expedition is just confined to the area around Col Colonia Dublon for the duration. So this is the end of about four months of active campaigning in Mexico. Um, from here, I'm going to talk for just a few minutes about some of the new technology used in, Mexi in the Mexican expedition. Um, so with the end of active campaigning, there's around 11,000 army regulars parked at Colonia Dublon. They need to be fed and supplied. Um, headquarters is on a rail line, but they can't really use it. Um, up until this moment, the standard vehicle in the army for transporting large amounts of material away from rail lines is the escort wagon. I have a picture of them here. Yep, so that's an escort wagon. These wagons are pulled by four mules a piece and they could carry 3,000 pounds. That's assuming that road conditions were good and that there were no steep grades to climb. Um, if a wagon had to climb uphill, the weight had to be reduced. Um, Chihuahua, there's uh, tons of steep grades and not very much grass. So there just weren't enough wagons to supply everyone um, at headquarters. So given all the constraints, Pershing and his quartermaster decide to start using trucks instead. Um, so the army had been purchasing trucks in small numbers over the past few years, um, but it's mostly just a few here and there. Um, they're used on posts to transport stuff locally, and no post has more than two or three trucks. In fact, in March 1916, the entire Southern Department had just 16 trucks. Um, Pershing's only able to locate 54 in the entire continental U.S., and these had to be transported in rail down to the border partially disassembled. So they arrive in Columbus actually without the bolts needed to reattach the chassis to the rest of the trucks. Um, so everyone has to sit there reassembling them for about a week after they get there. Um, back in Washington, General Hugh Scott became concerned that bottlenecks of goods were forming at Columbus. So as a result, he calls the quartermaster general to ask him what he needs to fix the problem. He asked for $450,000 to purchase new trucks and parts. Um, this is an estimate he just plucked in the air. It was just a magical number that like, it, like a fantasy number, like if you could have any amount of money, what would you need? This is what he comes up with. Um, but Scott tells him to just spend the money. He says, sure. Um, afterwards, he goes to Newton Baker and tells him about this. And Newton Baker sort of okays it. They have a laugh about it, even though this is an amount that usually you would have needed congressional approval to spend. Um, of course, the amounts are really paltry considering what they're about to spend in World War I, but at the time it's pretty outrageous. Um, because of this, the number of trucks really expands pretty rapidly after this, um, but the army didn't have enough trained drivers, so they do hire civilians for a time. The army actually pays them $100 a month, and this is a huge deal. This causes a lot of grumbling because the average soldier made $21 a month at the time. Um, but driving trucks was a really highly skilled profession. It requires a great deal of physical labor, and the experience, and you have to be really experienced in a wide range of makes and models of trucks and repairing them. Um, and over the summer, the army does manage to train more soldiers and start phasing out civilians. Um, the other thing that happens is the engineers start paving the roads. Um, they had started by repairing dirt roads, but they would just dig, they would dig them out. And then in the next storm, they would just get filled back in. So they actually start paving and they end up with about 150 miles of paved roads. So the area around Colonia Dublon. 
So in addition to trucks, uh, this is the first large army operation to make use of airplanes, right? And these are mainly used um, for communications and reconnaissance, not for combat. Um, they're flown by the first Aero Squadron, which was commanded by Captain ben Benjamin D. Fuloy. And in 1916, the army owned 13 airplanes total. Uh, eight were assigned to the first Aero Squadron, and all of these are Curtis JN biplanes, known as Jennies. Um, they're made of fabric, wood, and metal. The JN3s are pretty unreliable, um, and they suffer from some serious design defects. Uh, the first one, that's a big deal is the wooden propellers would split and warp in heat. This is a problem in the desert for obvious reasons. Um, the second is that the planes are only graded to fly to about 10,000 feet. The peaks in Chihuahua extend to about 10,000 feet so they can't make it over the mountains. Um, the third problem is that they're relatively unstable and they were actually prone to going into spins. And this is made worse by bad weather of which there is plenty in Chihuahua. So these problems really become apparent in sort of the first flight to Mexico. They're supposed to fly from Columbus to Colonia Dublan with eight planes. At night, they can only do this by sight, by following each other by sight. Right away, one has to land from mechanical trouble. Three of them peel off. They don't manage to make it. And four of them go off together, but they can't find the runway. It's supposed to be illuminated by bonfires and they never sight them. So they go fly off somewhere else. None of them can really find the runway. Um, so you can see sort of the challenges. Uh, they managed to find it the next day, but it takes them several days to sort of get back together. Um, you can see they're already having a hard time operating in Mexico. Um, by June, actually, all of the original eight planes were out of service or had been cannibalized for parts. Uh, Fuloy tries for months to get money, but it's not as easy as with trucks. Finally, Congress patches, passes the Urgent Efficiency Act. This allocates about $500,000 to buy planes. Um, and the first Aero Squadron starts getting them in summer. Um, oh yeah, so here we have some trucks. Uh, oh, this is Benjamin Fuloy. And this is a picture of one of the Jennies. There's a second one here. Um, back on the ground, the regulars spent the rest of the summer into winter in Colonia Dublon training. Pershing sets up a rigorous daily schedule to try to fend off boredom. They, uh, they hunt, they play sports, they train. That's pretty much what they do. Um, meanwhile, in July, Villa was recovering from his wounds and he finally consented to have that surgery to remove, remove bone fragments. He starts campaigning again in September. Um, meanwhile, the US, is spent, US and Mexico are spending these months negotiating Pershing's withdrawal. And in December, they finally come to an agreement they withdraw in February, 1917. Um, in January, the US becomes aware that German foreign minister Arthur Zimmerman has sent a telegram to Carranza's government offering them a deal. And if Mexico goes to war with the US on the border and ties up their forces, he will give them back the areas of Northern Mexico that went to the US in the Mexican-American war. Um, this is known as the Zimmerman telegram. And this sounds pretty, fantastical when you read it in a history book, but hopefully it makes more sense in the context of the fact that the U.S. and Mexico had very narrowly just uh, missed going to war with each other a few months before. So the Wilson government releases the telegram to the public in February. In April, the U.S. has declared war on Germany. Um, and Villa continues campaigning. Uh, Carranza was assassinated in 1920. Um, the new government offers Villa a deal to retire, and he took it, and he lived until 1923. So I'm just going to say one concluding, couple concluding things. So just how should we think about the expedition? Um, Pershing doesn't fulfill his mission of permanently disabling Villa. He's still around. Um, but at the same time, the army becomes much more prepared for France than it could have been if the expedition hadn't happened. Um, the army goes from having two truck companies to 17. The first aero squadron goes from having eight defective, terrible airplanes to having orders in for 346 airplanes by the beginning of 1917. And more importantly, it's a testing ground for regulars and it's a sort of mini deployment of all the National Guard that get deployed to the border in preparation for the much larger deployment to France that is coming. Um, it also proves Pershing's mettle. He has a couple black eyes here and there, but he clearly proves himself as an effective commander in the field. And these are all elements that are going to become very important in the coming years and months in World War II in France. Um, 
with that, I'll leave it for questions. Okay, thank you, Julie, very much. Very a lot of detail there, and a lot of uh, very interesting aspects that uh, uh, I was not familiar with. So I'm, I'm really glad you went into a lot of that detail. Um, why don't we go ahead with a, uh, a few questions here? Um, one of them is a specific one. What what was the closest uh, significant army base or fort or outpost to Columbus, New Mexico? Um, probably Fort Bliss. I mean, Fort Bliss is the big one where there actually are a lot of people. Um, but obviously that's not, that wouldn't have been a big target for the Vistas because that really was well defended. Uh, another one, you started to go into uh, kind of the ending of the expedition. What, if anything, did Pershing learn from this, uh, this campaign <clears throat> in uh, Mexico and New Mexico? And was he, was he able to glean any experience that he could use in World War I? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple of things to remember. One um, is that this gives him experience commanding a larger, a larger number of troops, so doing multi-unit operations. Up until now, maybe you would have been commanding smaller numbers, a couple hundred, couple thousand troops. So this is 11,000. So it gives him a good test case to manage just manage more people and more complex operations over a really wide area of space. Um, under really adverse conditions too. So people who are very far flung, um, people who are hard to communicate with, that's a big deal in France, um, getting your communication straight and learning how to do that. Um, so I think he takes that with him. He also, um, he also is a person who manages to get a lot of loyalty out of his subordinates. And I think that is part of what he learns is how to hone that. Um, he already had some practice in that obviously in the Philippines, but, um, this is a place where he really gets to refine, um, I think, a lot of what makes him um, a commander and a commander that people uh, look in, look up to um, and someone who they who they want to follow. So um, what were the total U.S. casualties for the expedition? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'd have to look it up to find out the exact number. It's probably ranging somewhere in the 20s. Um, so it's not a ton overall. And obviously um, compared to France, it's a pittance, right? Um, but there are some casualties and there are, um, uh, Chihuahua turns out to be a somewhat dangerous place, right? Um, not only because of the skirmishes that they have, but also because um, it is such a harsh environment. Um, there are uh, problems getting water and food. So, so there's a lot of casualties um, in that regard. Although there wasn't um, a lot of illness in terms of, um, in terms of health, they're actually pretty healthy. Mm -hmm. So that brings us to a, a one of our audience, uh, another one of our audience members asked, how did the expedition provide fuel to trucks and planes inside Mexico? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, a lot of it, I think, comes on the trucks themselves and they are able to use the railroads for at least the first few days. So they get an initial push where they're able to get fuel in there, um, I believe, but they are able to carry around gas and canisters essentially, which does reduce the amount um, of stuff that they're able to take, right? Because they do have to take reserve fuel with them. They also, these trucks, because they break down all the time, they also have to take a lot of tools with them. So a lot of the space um, that's taken up sort of in the back is taken up with these like huge tool sets. They usually have a mechanic on board. So they have two people driving them and they have a mechanic usually in the back who's there to replace anything if needed. So they have to carry all these spare parts. There is a lot of stuff um, that they have to carry you know, including gasoline, but they still end up being much more efficient than wagons, right? Because wagons have some of the same problems, right? Where they don't have to carry gas, but they have to carry fodder, right? And they can carry less overall. So despite the fact that they have to carry these like big canisters of gas and all these tools and several people, they still are able to carry much, much more than what you, would, what you could haul by mule, essentially. Mm -hmm. 
Another question from uh, one of our audience members is, how did Pancho Villa become such a popular celebrity in the US after the Pershing expedition, such as appearing in films, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. I think a lot of it really dates from that period that I was talking about where he really was sort of like at the height of his power and he becomes this romantic figure. You know, he does actually have some newsreel men from the US who are filming him, who are following him around and film, filming him. And during part of that time, actually, he has his own train. So he rides around in a train all over Northern Mexico. He's able to care who to um, have all these people following him, all these newspaper men, all these journalists. And he's charming and he gives good sound bites. So they do follow him around and they do write stories about him. And he has these costumes that he puts on for the newsreels that they film him in. Some of those costumes that you think of in terms of like, oh, that's what Pancho Villa wears. Those like, you know, those like outfits <laughs> that he wears. I, I don't even know how to explain it, but the sort of like uniform that you think of as Pancho Villa, mm -hmm. those are actually really costumes that he put on for newsreels, you know, for consumption for public consumption right so he's very good at image making himself mm -hmm. um, and the people around him too are really good at sort of like building up the lore of Pancho Villa I, I think also the fact that people don't know a lot about his early history and about the, fa the fact that he did keep it so hazy I think part that part of part of that sort of like feeds into the lore too that he could tell all these wonderful stories about how like he was an outlaw and a bandit and he did all of these things in his youth. And we don't really know what part of that was true and what part of that was maybe exaggeration. Um, so I think all of that sort of has fed into this great lore of Pancho Villa, some of which is correct, some of which is not. And it's sometimes really tough to discern what goes into what category. Mm -hmm. um, did the army use radios or heliographs to communicate, do you know? Yeah, they did. So they used radios. Um, they do have signal corps members who are there. And there aren't there weren't that many telegraph lines actually in northern Mexico. So they had to lay their own telegraph lines. They lay they lay buzzer lines across a lot of a lot of northern Mexico, which is these like uninsulated, I believe they're copper lines. Um, that allow them to uh, to essentially like lay telegraph line almost anywhere. Um, but these end up being sort of unreliable, kind of bad for northern Mexico because the cavalry will usually just trample them and then it cuts the line sort of uh, at inconvenient moments. Um, this is why it's so difficult. You can sort of see a theme through this, right, that it's, it's hard for Pershing to really communicate with the U.S. and it was hard for him to communicate with his cavalry in the field. <clears throat> Pardon. And a lot of the reason for that is that the communications are pretty poor and there really are very few telegraph lines, but they do they do have them and they do have radios. Uh, one of our audience members uh, has a great uncle who participated in the expedition. And he asks, is there a good source to research the expedition at a regimental level to try to figure out where a soldier may have served? Yeah, that is a really tough. Um, that's a really tough one at that level. Um, I mean, the only thing I could say is really, if you've been through the records at NARA, that will tell you, you know, everything, pretty much everything that we know. You can read the final report to um, Pershing's final report of the expedition online. Um, that won't tell you sort of at the regimental level really what's going on. Um, but it'll give you a little bit more information about maybe some clues about where he might have been. Yeah, but NARA, unfortunately, the National Archives, which is um, over here in College Park, is really going to have um, the, the best records for that. Uh, one of our audience members says uh, was asking about the, um, you mentioned George S. Patton. Uh, were there any other uh, prominent or, or soldiers or pilots that participated in this expedition that later became prominent in World War I or World War II? Um, that's a good question. I mean, um, I'd say, uh, I mean, he's obviously the most prominent person, but uh, I mean, I'd say Benjamin Fuloy, he becomes pretty prominent. He becomes a brigadier general um, and uh, a, a really famous person, maybe a person who hasn't become as famous, uh, who hasn't stayed famous now, but I think up through the 50s and 60s was a pretty well-known figure and is a pretty well-known figure in terms of aviation history. So, um, and he's a really 
fascinating person. Um, I think really interesting. Um, anyone else? I mean, I think Patton is probably the most mm -hmm. sort of like standout person. And he's really talked about a lot in terms of the expedition. I think a lot of people put stock, a lot of stock in the fact that he was there. Um, and um, see, see, this is sort of like an, an early moment of, uh, of greatness and of, uh, of uh, er early promise, um, of, which it, of which it is. I mean, you can't say that it's not, but, uh, but also, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a lieutenant then. He's still, he's still not the, the patent that we know later. Uh, Julie Prieto from the Center of Military History at Fort McNair, thank you very much for being with us. We appreciate your time. Uh, if, you're, if you've been looking at the chat, there's a lot of folks that are saying great presentation, fantastic presentation. So uh, I'm glad I had the forethought to invite you to this program. All right, thanks for inviting me. All right, well, folks in the audience, we thank for you for your participation and uh, we hope to see you down the road at some other um, uh, of our programs, both virtually and in person. Come see us at the museum if you haven't visited and with that, we will say good night to Julie and everybody else and um, come see us and good night.